Welcome to Alaska Weather, a production of Alaska Public Media and the National Weather Service, Alaska Region. Produced and broadcast daily from the studios of KAKM, Alaska Weather provides complete forecasts, public, marine, and aviation for all of Alaska. Alaska Weather is made possible by the following sponsors. Inlet Tug and Barge is a marine transportation company specializing in harbor services with a primary marketing focus on the Port of Anchorage, providing their customers with quality based service specifically tailored to their needs. The National Weather Service. Good Tuesday, everyone. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder with the National Weather Service. It is uh, July the 15th. As always, we encourage you to stay up to date with your latest weather information online or by NOAA Weather Radio. Online, you can reach us at weather.gov slash Alaska. Give us a call on the weather info line at 1-800-472-0391. Between the Alaska weather shows and throughout your day on your mobile device and across the state, you can find weather information from NWS Alaska, NWS Anchorage, or NWS Fairbanks, or even NWS Juno on Twitter. On Facebook, we're all in one group. That's NWS Alaska, of course. And on YouTube, before we get to Alaska weather time in the late afternoon and early evening, you can find a brief broadcast of the surface charts and how the weather is progressing around our state at uh, NWS Anchorage or NWS Fairbanks on YouTube there. And after the show, of course, type in AKWX TV in your YouTube search bar and you can find this complete broadcast from our broadcast partners here at Alaska Public or go to their website at alaskapublic.org to watch the entire video if you like. Hazardous weather tonight includes flood warnings across the south-facing slopes of the Brooks Range all the way through areas around Ambler and Bettles, mainly around the Koyukuk and Kobuk Rivers there. And we're talking about uh, some uh, flooding around the Hughes and uh, Shugnak areas, uh, mainly upstream there. It looks like there will be debris and erosion expected as that moves down the river there. Probably going to see the crest around Bettles later tonight and then around Alakakit on Wednesday. So uh, definitely some flooding concerns in those areas. Flood warnings continue into tomorrow. And south of that, you're looking at the small stream flood advisories for many areas in the uh, lower Tanana Valley into the Yukon Valley and that across into the Seward Peninsula and the Norton Sound communities as well as the upper Kuskokwim thanks to many areas receiving at least one to two inches of rain in recent days. And there's more rain on the way so we'll continue to monitor those stream levels across the heart of Alaska there as we head into tonight. Now outside of those areas we're still looking at fire danger and some of that fire danger remains high across the eastern and northern slopes of the Alaska Range into uh, places in the upper Tanana Valley and perhaps some areas around the Glen Allen region and we're starting to see some signs of drier conditions there across uh, the central and northern sections of the Kenai Peninsula but uh, just kind of a barely elevated at this point as you would expect. Now as you look out to the west we're looking for changes in the satellite trends there and we still have a huge high parked right across the central and western chain of Alaska. What that's doing is feeding moisture right into the center of Alaska. As you notice with the waves of precipitation working through there in recent days, uh, that trend is not going to change a whole lot. We have other impulses that are coming up from the south and west. And I'll be the first to say that the forecast models are doing a very poor job figuring out where some of these storms are going to track into the Gulf. And as a result, uh, you're probably going to see some changes in our forecast as we get into Thursday and Friday. So keep that in mind, especially if you're watching the weather here in the central Gulf or across southeastern Alaska. Here's the visible satellite picture, and this gets more of a truer picture of what's going on from outer space looking down on the 49th. Across southeast, you can see the clouds were breaking up a little bit this afternoon. A lot of fair weather across the northern Gulf all the way up to Kodiak and the south central parts into Prince William Sound. And then once you get north of the Alaska Range, the clouds really fill in. There wasn't a whole lot seeming to fall from these clouds today, especially in those areas where we saw one to two inches of rain. That's probably good news. Out across the west, thanks to high pressure, you can see the low clouds, stratus and fog 
fog socked in at very low levels. And as always, if I can point it out, I will. Here's some of the ship tracks there. Much like the way a contrail forms in the atmosphere, a ship trail marks the path of uh, ocean faring vessels there. Uh, just kind of uh, churning up the water and the air just a little bit in that very stable environment so we can kind of see where you've been if you've been north of ADAC today. The visible satellite picture once again shows a lot of cloud cover mainly north of Barrow as well. The winds are changing there. Watch for some stronger winds to develop mainly north of the Bering Strait. Uh, you'll see those reflected in your marine weather forecast here in just a little bit. Surface weather now. We've got colder northwesterly winds driving into the coastal plain and into the Beaufort Sea Coast as we head through this afternoon. Another wave of rain working into the Seward Peninsula and the Kotzebue Sound region. Some showers were noted across the interior, mainly north of Denali. Uh, showers and thunderstorms there across the Yukon with high pressure across the central gulf. We've got that downward moving air here trying to keep clouds from forming across the northern gulf. Meanwhile, just to the south, another area of low pressure is lifting that air, making it easier for clouds to form. Across the Bering Sea, you can see uh, more unstable weather here. That uh, kind of ripply pattern indicates rising air, and uh, that is certainly feeding into those pockets of wetter weather across the central and western parts of Alaska, and there's more to come. And as we head into tonight, you can see that trail already forming out into the central and northern Bering. Colder air is trying to drop eastward into the far eastern sections of Siberia into the Gulf of Anadir. Showers will likely pop up across the central interior. Most of south central, southwestern Alaska and certainly southeast should be dry with low pressure here lurking in the central and western Gulf. High pressure remains in control across uh, Bristol Bay and across areas south of the Pribilovs to the Aleutian chain. Heading into Wednesday, colder air is slow to move through the Bering Strait. You'll notice that onshore flow picking up, though, into the Seward Peninsula and Norton Sound. More of a south and westerly flow should be expected. And there will be some areas of widespread wet weather across the north and northwestern parts of our state, including the Beaufort Sea Coast, uh, trapped on the other side of a frontal boundary. That could mean more of a north and easterly flow for you, feeding into a little bit of a stronger area of low pressure north and west of Vero. High pressure is going to sit across the northern sections of the Gulf of Alaska. That should keep southeast in a pretty dry spot there for the next day or so. Low pressure, and this is one of the spots we've got a big question mark around, is, is trying to work into this ridge of high pressure. Not doing a very good job uh, reflected in the forecast models there, so we're really having to draw a lot of different uh, ways this weather is going to happen here as we get into Wednesday and Thursday. This is one way. As we get into Thursday, low pressure doesn't look like it moves too much. In fact, right now the current forecast has this low tracking a little bit more east than north. And that was not the case yesterday at all. So if you're saying, wow, that's really not what Thursday looked like yesterday, you'd be right. The models have changed things and our forecasts have shifted as a result. So maybe a little bit of a different forecast for south central than what we were talking about yesterday. The current trajectory has us moving eastward toward southeastern Alaska now as we head into Friday and Saturday. Up to the north now, a cold front is trying to drop southward. Finally moving off of eastern Siberia, it will bring more of a south and westerly flow into the YK and into the interior. With that, we expect a better chance of rainfall to occur again. Showers and thunderstorms mainly around the Talkeetnas and northward, probably the eastern sections of the Alaska Range. And low pressure still sitting north and west of Barrow, now down to 995 millibars. While high pressure probably forms across the western Bering and out across Attu, anywhere from 1,016 millibars to 1,025 millibars. So things will pretty much be status quo if you're sitting in the central and western chain, areas of low clouds and fog, maybe a brief round of drizzle or a light shower in areas around the Pribilovs, right there on the edge of light rain to fog and stratus. Here's what we have for current temperatures today. And my apologies to southeast. I saved the wrong map in your southeast temperature spot. So this is what I have for you today. We'll have the right one tomorrow. Temperatures in the lower 70s from Hyder all the way into a net in Ketchikan. It was a warm day there. In the center parts of southeast, we saw 63 degrees around Petersburg, uh, 64 actually there for you. Sitka was 54, 66 in Juneau, and 57 around Haines and Skagway with temperatures in the Yukon in the lower 70s up around Whitehorse. 57 was the temp in Yakutat today. Prince William Sound in the upper 50s and lower 60s around Seward, 62 degrees there, 61 in Kenai, 66 in Anchorage, and upper 60s for uh, areas in the Susitna Valley. Mid-50s for parts of uh, the Tananaw Valley, 68 degrees around Northway and Eagle and Toke, all very mild today. Looking farther northward, you'll notice temps in the 50s and 60s around the Brooks Range. The Arctic Coast saw readings as cold as 39 in Kaktovik on the other side of the front, and then just west of it, temps shot up into the 40s and 50s, including Barrow, almost at that 50-degree point. Kotzebue Sound, we're looking at temps in the low to mid-50s. Uh, Shishmaref was 52 on the colder side of Seward. 
of Peninsula today, 46 in Nome, 64 in Unalakleet, Bethel was showing 63, Nunavak Island also in the lower 60s, McGrath a m much milder, 67, while Tanana was in the mid-50s. Looking out toward the Aleutians, you can see readings were uh, in the 50s and 60s for the Alaska Peninsula, 57 around Sand Point, 53 in Dutch Harbor in Alaska, low to mid-50s for the Pribilovs, and 48 around Attu, while Adak and Atka were at 52 and 55 degrees respectively. Now looking into the heart of Alaska tonight, low temperatures should hover in the low to mid 50s areas northward, probably not a whole lot colder, even under the chance of rain. You see temps there as cold as the mid 40s. Uh, some Arctic coast temperatures might dip into the 30s there from uh, Barrow out toward Wainwright. The Seward Peninsula generally in the upper 40s and lower 50s. Southwest closer to 50 degrees, including areas near Bethel. Uh, looks like temps at or just below the 50 degree mark for the Alaska Peninsula all the way out toward the western chain and 40s and 50s for southeast with south central also in the upper 40s to lower 50s. High temperatures tomorrow in south central probably closing in on the mid 60s to even lower 70s the further in inland you go up the parks highway. 60s to almost 70 degrees for some areas in southeast. The warmest weather, of course, around Ketchikan, Annette, and Metlakatla. Upper 50s to lower 60s for the Alaska Peninsula and the eastern chain. Uh, St. Paul and St. George looking at 53 degrees tomorrow. 52 around St. Lawrence Island, Gamble and Sabunga included. And 55 in Nome with Kotzebue Sound looking at temps just hovering below the 60 degree mark. And look for cooler weather, though, as that southwesterly wind starts to kick in a little bit more around the Chukchi Sea coast in coming days. Now, flying weather is going to change across the west and northwest as more rain and cloud cover moves in. So watch for weather to deteriorate as we go into the rest of the week. Now, south central and southeast, conditions should remain pretty good. You'll, you're looking at at least VFR, uh, probably a much improved weather over uh, recent weeks for you. Uh, the chain and a good part of the Alaska Peninsula looking at at least MVFR conditions. Checking your pass conditions then, Anaktuvik and Adigan Pass will trend toward IFR conditions during the day on and off. It may hover close to MVFR for a few hours and switch over to IFR. So plan for IFR and hope for the best. Lake Clark and Merrill Pass expecting VFR, but uh, convective weather is possible tomorrow. Rainy Pass expecting VFR conditions there. MVFR trending toward VFR conditions for Windy Pass. Things look good in Isabel Pass for your Wednesday. Mentasta Pass also expecting VFR conditions. Tanita Pass will see improvements during the day, but watch for some thunderstorms. Portage Pass should see VFR. And Chilkoot and White Pass, uh, boy, it looks like great weather to fly in southeast tomorrow. The freezing levels are showing pretty high levels right now across the Bering and across interior Alaska. Anywhere from 8 to 10,000 feet. Uh, a little bit cooler there south of Kodiak Island into the western Gulf. And much higher conditions there from 10, 12, even 14,000 feet heading south and east from southeastern Alaska. Icing potential generally is going to have to go up there. So freezing level or maybe about 8,000 feet on up. A light to isolated moderate is possible there with that lift moving through. Not a whole lot of icing has been reported in recent days though. Tomorrow's jet stream shows a little bit more of a north and westerly kick coming into the Bering Strait. Another trough of low pressure working into the northern Yukon, but the main quarter of storm activity coming out of eastern Asia is still well south of Alaska. And with that, we have high pressure trying to control things from the western Bering. At 9,000 feet, a broad southwesterly flow working across the Gulf with 15 to 20 knot winds closer to southeastern Alaska. But the winds start to pick up a little bit closer to that low pressure system that's working into the western Gulf. And again, we're going to keep an eye on this one because models are not doing a good job helping us out right now. Looking across the west in the YK, we have light onshore flow at 10 knots, but more of a stronger offshore flow right now south of Bethel. That's coming in from the north and east around 20 knots and wrapping into high pressure across the western bearing. At 3,000 feet, that ridge shifts east just a little bit more, so we have more control there coming in from the west, 20 to maybe 15 knots onshore as we get into Bethel and parts of the YK. Just north of that, though, and along the Yukon Valley, wind speeds are running 20 to 30 knots, so a little bit stronger there across the interior and across the northwest. Look for a west and southwesterly flow crossing the western Brooks Range at 20 knots. More of a northwesterly flow at 25 knots over southeast, and winds are a little bit stronger south and east of Kodiak Island, as high as 50 knots, again, on the east side of that low pressure system. Turbulence, yeah, you'll want to watch out for some of that along that south and westerly moving flow of air that's bringing rain and maybe some thunderstorms to parts of the Alaska Range and Talkeetnas. Uh, turbulence chop probably above 2,000 feet to below 8,000 feet and above 2,000 feet up across the Arctic coast, generally east of Barrow. That's a look at your aviation forecast. We'll be back in just a few minutes with your marine weather. Stay tuned.
Short field landings are where the POH may lead you to develop a false sense of safety. The operating handbook may say the ground roll is less than 1,000 feet, so you figure you'll have no problem getting into a 2,500 foot strip. But if you float down 1,500 feet of pavement before your wheels touch because of poor airspeed control, there's going to be trouble. It's not the ground roll, but the distance used before the wheels touch that counts. The landing roll numbers don't begin until the aircraft is firmly on the runway and rolling, not floating. Short field approaches are always performed power on at slower than normal airspeeds. Check your POH for manufacturer's recommendations. At the slower airspeed, the airplane will decelerate rapidly when power is reduced for landing. Land on the main wheels and hold the nose wheel off for aerodynamic braking. Maintain full back pressure and be prepared to brake aggressively during the landing rollout, but don't apply brakes until the nose wheel is on the ground. Braking too soon can cause the main wheels to skid, increasing the landing roll and possibly damaging the tires. And of course, be prepared to go around any time an approach or landing isn't working out. Now let's look at short field technique. These are more real life examples, and again, we'll score them from one to 10, 10 being the best. Let's bring on contestant number one. The PA-28 makes a good approach, a good landing, and the rollout. Hey, hey, no smoking on the airport. Now you see what happens to your tires when you rely on the brakes to slow you down. Control your airspeed on the approach, and that won't happen. That rates a 6.0 in my book. Here's a new Cirrus. OK, a little bit of a float. He's holding the nose up, putting it in a good landing attitude, and earning a hefty 8.2 for the effort. Our next two contestants are a pair of PA-38s. Here's number one. Hang time of three seconds. That's good. That's good. And here's number two. Watch the difference airspeed control makes. OK, the flare. Look at that hang time. An impressive seven seconds. Wait for me. Looks like he doesn't want his buddy to leave him behind. These pilots earn a collective score of 6.6 .6 in pairs competition. Here's a PA-28. Bang! An excellent carrier landing. He could have used the runway jack on that one. Another two feet of airport elevation, and that would have been a greaser. So we'll deduct points accordingly and give that landing a 4-0. Out of the clear blue of the western sky comes Sky King! This Cessna 310 pilot has the airspeed under control, makes a nice flare right on the center line, a little bit flat on the attitude, but the landing still rates an 8.9. Here's another example of the effects of excessive airspeed on landing distance. Considering how much runway he's gliding over, this Piper pilot almost qualifies for a float plane rating. And note the almost three point landing. And that's going to cost points on the landometer. The judges score that a 6.2. Watch this Seneca. I'm taking bets on when he's going to land. This plane is floating so far it almost qualifies as an amphibian. If you're feeling a little restless, now's the time to stretch your legs. We could be here a while before he lands. Finally, we'll give him a 5.8 for that effort. Here's a beach Sierra making a nice approach, a good landing. Uh-oh, look at the smoke from that braking action. Tire companies love to see technique like this. It means they'll be selling lots of new tires. Uh, for the rest of us, that rates a 3.5 on the landometer. This Mooney pilot has the airspeed under control, but the landing is flat. And here's the exciting part. It's a tire-burning, avgas-powered Mooney body plane! Remember what that looks like next time you're tempted to control your rollout with excessive braking. For his heavy footwork, the Mooney pilot gets a 4.5. Hampshire traffic, Piper Colt, 49018 Zulu, turning final for runway 32, Hampshire Field. Well, here goes, my very first soft field landing without an instructor aboard. Those trees at the approach end look pretty tall. I better stay a little high here. Okay, great, I cleared them. Boy, this field is really short. Mm. Airspeed's a little high, but I guess the turf will uh, slow me down a bit. Okay, almost ready for the flare. Man, I know my airspeed's a little high, but it looks like we're going a lot faster than indicated. What's going on here? Now my airspeed's right, but I'm still going way fast. 
the way I'm floating, I'll be lucky to get this thing on the ground halfway down the runway. No, make that two-thirds of the way, or maybe a little more than two-thirds. How about three-quarters? Hey, the windsock, that was pointed the same direction I'm going. No time to worry about that now. I don't have much room to get this thing on the ground anyway. Come on, land already. All right, Eagle has landed, but it sure isn't slowing down. I better go around. No, I think it's too late to go around now. Hey, is that the end of the runway coming up? No, that was the end of the runway that just went by. Whoa, Nelly. Fence post up ahead. Here's a classic accident scenario. A low time pilot versus a challenging situation. Here, the challenges of a short runway and obstacles on final were compounded by landing downwind and poor airspeed control. This hapless pilot also assumed that the turf field was also soft. Although all short fields are not necessarily soft, it's likely that a soft field will also be short. Lots of pilots are hesitant to land at turf fields. Some think it's going to damage the airplane somehow. Actually, turf is easier on airplanes than pavement. It's softer. There's more give on touchdown. Tires last a lot longer. And though takeoff and landing distances may be higher than pavement, most public use turf fields have adequate length for safe light single engine operations. If possible, don't begin the takeoff roll from a dead stop. Taxi onto the runway and advance the throttle smoothly as you turn to the runway heading. If the field is soft, use soft field procedures. The technique is to get the weight off the nose wheel, making it less likely that the nose wheel will dig into terra infirma. The yoke or stick should be full back, ailerons deflected as wind conditions dictate. As the nose starts to come up, release back pressure and accelerate with the nose wheel slightly off the ground. As back pressure is slowly relaxed, drag is reduced, and speed and lift increase. The plane will lift off at a slower than normal airspeed. Release more back pressure and remain in ground effect to build up airspeed. Then commence a climb out as you would in a normal takeoff. It's also important to keep the weight off the nose wheel in soft field landings. Carry a little power into the landing and touch down as softly as possible on the main wheels. Then smoothly lower the nose wheel to the ground. The yoke should be held all the way back throughout the rollout. Time for your marine weather now across southeast. High pressure is in control, at least of southeast for right now. So winds will be pretty light across coastal areas around 10 to 15 knots. The sea is going to be a little bit higher than normal thanks to uh, areas of low pressure just to the south and west there. You might see some higher waves than normal. Four to five feet in most areas along the coast. For the inner waters, three to four foot seas are expected with more of a westerly wind working into uh, Frederick Sound, 15 knots, more of a southerly flow across the Lynn Canal at 20 knots, and a northwesterly wind the further south you go toward Ketchikan and Fentlakotlin. Now for Thursday, a little bit more of a southerly change there, responding to that low pressure system working in a little bit more. Uh, 15 knot wind coming in along coastal areas with four foot seas there. A northwesterly wind continues around Frederick Sound and Stevens Passage. Southerlies for the Lynn Canal, 15 knots there with a three foot sea, and northwesterlies around 15 knots with a three foot sea in the south. Across south central, more of a south and westerly flow will be predominant as we go through Wednesday. The strongest winds there will be just south and west of Kenai at 20 knots with six foot seas. Otherwise, southwesterly is around 15 knots on either side of the Barren Islands and Kodiak Island at 15 knots with four to five foot seas there. And variable flow and light winds across Prince William Sound should be a good day out in the water with a two foot sea expected. More of the uh, variable winds and very light conditions should be expected across the western Gulf as we get into Thursday, but we'll keep that southwesterly flow traveling from Chelikoff Strait west of the Barrens all the way up to Cook Inlet around 15 knots with four to as high as six foot seas, again just south and west of Kenai. So diff netters might have to hold on a little bit more. Out around Bristol Bay, look for a westerly flow around 10 knots with a two foot sea. Variable flow north of Cold Bay, three foot seas there. Otherwise, an east to westerly flow on the Pacific side at 10 to 15 knots with a six foot sea on Wednesday. By Thursday, you can see the result of high pressure working its way eastward a little bit more. We get that westerly flow into Bristol Bay and across the Alaska Peninsula waters in the Bering and north and westerly winds on the Pacific side with four to five foot seas there. Across the Aleutians, on the other side of the ridge, we have north and easterly winds coming in at 10, 15, even 25 knots there as you get into Kiska at 25 knots with a five foot sea. More of a northeasterly flow across the Pacific with six foot seas under 20 knot winds and a southeasterly flow for Attu as the winds wrap around. High pressure still shifting around by Thursday, and we still have some areas picking up slightly stronger winds, generally west of Nikolsky and east of Atka. 25 knots with a 4-foot sea there, otherwise 5 to 6-foot seas in the Pacific. Seas could be as small as 2 feet north of Unalaska Dutch Harbor. 
and again as high as 5 feet out in the west around Kisco with that northeasterly flow at 20 knots. For the west coast, a southwesterly wind coming into Gamble uh, north of Nunavak Island in the St. Matthew Island water. 7 to 9 foot seas are expected there. Light and variable winds around the Pribilovs with a 3 foot sea and an onshore flow into Kuskokwim Bay under 15 knots. Northerlies kick in again around St. Lawrence Island. Otherwise, it's an onshore flow at 20 knots coming into McCoryuk. Six to seven foot seas there for areas south of Hooper Bay and also uh, for the Kuskokwim Bay area. Five foot seas there, more of a westerly shift there for the Pribilovs under 20 knot winds. For the Arctic coast, watch for some strong winds over the next couple days. More of a southeasterly flow, 15 to 20 knots with three foot seas and more water opening up there. There is no longer any shore fast ice according to our sea ice experts here. Uh, we're expecting the ice to continue to shift around, of course, and it's not entirely gone. But the shore fast ice now is loose, at least. Uh, west and southwesterly flow north of Point Lay and Cape Lismore, looking at more of a westerly flow at 6 foot seas there and 25 knots, and a southwesterly flow inside of Kotzebue Sound at 20 knots with 5 foot seas. Now, as we get into Thursday, uh, the winds shift a little bit more to the south and west with 10 knots around Barrow. Stronger northwesterly flow following the front. Coming into Point Hope and Cape Lisburn, 30 knots there from the north and west will give us 9 foot seas. Same goes for Kotzebue Sound and a westerly flow north of Prudhoe Bay with southeasterlies continuing around Kakovic with a 4 foot sea on Thursday. Recapping tonight's weather, more rains on the way for the central and northwestern interior, including some of the already swollen watersheds there where flood warnings continue for the Kobuk. Uh, many areas uh, in the south facing slopes of the Brooks Range out toward uh, Hughes and Alakak are expecting at least some flooding and probably some erosion as well with debris coming down the river. A northwesterly flow just west of the Bering Strait will continue to move a frontal boundary toward the Seward Peninsula as we get into Wednesday. More of a south and westerly wind will kick in, a better chance for rainfall in the northwestern part of the state. Otherwise, spotty showers and maybe a few storms across higher terrain. Southeast, you're looking dry as we head toward the end of the week with a few showers developing across the Chugach and otherwise across the YK. Thanks for watching Alaska Weather. These forecasts are to be used for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go flying. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbor master before you go boating. Alaska weather is made possible by the following sponsors. The National Weather Service. It isn't fate, and it isn't luck that this home burned down, and this home didn't. The difference is being firewise. Use non-combustible roofing. Screen your attic and eave vents. Create a three-foot area around your house with fire-resistant vegetation or rock gardens. Remove tall grass and spruce trees within 15 feet and keep firewood 30 feet away. Take the steps to protect your home today before tragedy like this happens to you. Wildfires happen. Be ready.